Today we're going to be talking about historical steels and how those steels affect sword design and use. And welcome back! We wanted to make this an episode of Your Edge and perhaps this is the better uh, Your Edge episode out of all of them. However, we're talking about data and science. I originally planned this to be a response to Shady Versity on his misconceptions about katanas, however it goes far beyond that. You see, a lot of individuals and practitioners of historical European and other martial arts have an understanding of a European sword as being very springy, a katana as taking a set, and crucible steel as being super awesome and uh, be tied around one's waist and can cut a silk handkerchief. All those things are products of a fairly late uh, advertisement campaign by European merchants in about the 17th century. So let's delve into the reality of the matter. But before we get started with this awesome video with Ilya, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, our returning sponsor, and that is the awesome mobile game Raid Shadow Legends. Now guys, you know that I'm a gamer. I stream on Twitch under the name StalkerTron. I would not try to push a game on you that wasn't absolutely quality. And yes, this is a mobile game, but it plays much more like a PC or even a console game. There's so much new content, there's always something to do. Whether you like to go on raids, whether you like to battle bosses, or even PvP, Raid Shadow Legends has it all, and they're constantly adding new characters, quests, and all kinds of awesome items. Go to the video description, click on the special links, and if you're a new player, you'll get 100,000 free silver, one energy refill, one day XP booster, and one free champion adjudicator. Once you've logged in, claimed your rewards, you click the little treasure chest at the top, claim everything you'll get. And I've gotten so many awesome champions, but you, you get to start off with the Adjudicator. What a boost. Raid Shadow Legends has so much to do, so many champions to choose from, it's hard to believe it's a free mobile game. These awesome rewards will only be available for the next 30 days, so don't miss out. Click the link below and try out Raid Shadow Legends today. You won't be sorry. Historical steels of the medieval period can be roughly divided into two major groups, one being crucible steel, very ubiquitous in the Middle East as well as India, and the other being various versions of bloomery steels. Now, bloomery steels can technically be divided into bloomeries produced by a bloomery furnace and the blast furnace. However, I will explain later why I will not make the distinction between the two. Let's begin first with bloomery steels, as they are assumed to be earlier in the development than crucible steels. A bloomery steel, or bloomery iron, depending on which one you're using, is produced in a smelter that looks either like a big trough, big bathtub, or a smaller pipe stack. You put charcoal on top, light a fire, and then what happens is that as the charcoal burns, you start putting successive layers of charcoal and ore. And as the ore heats up, all the slag, also known as molten rock, melts out of it. Uh, what remains is the rust or iron oxide of various uh, pedigrees. And as the charcoal burns further in an anaerobic atmosphere, it sucks out the oxygen, leaving iron droplets which stick together and accumulate at the bottom. If your smelter is hot enough, it also injects the carbon, also known as uh, burning charcoal, into the iron producing steel. That has been the traditional way of making steel in Europe as well as in a lot of Asia. Uh, the common understanding of bloomery steel is that you have to refine it after you receive it because often enough it contains a lot of slag in it. Uh, slag still has to go down so it will penetrate often enough your bloomery, uh, your bloom, or kara if you're in Japan. However, uh, that is the understanding that is produced by modern practitioners of bloomery smelting, and modern practitioners of bloomery smelting very often do not have centuries and centuries of experience and education to fall back on. In my hand, I have a piece of bloomery <clears throat> or uh, tamahagani from Japan, 
and this particular piece contains virtually no slag. So it is fairly clean, although it's fairly high in carbon. It is approximately 1.4% carbon, not very evenly distributed. So to refine it, me or any other smith will have to flatten it out and start folding it, and then we'll get rid of some of these bubbles, break down the grain structure, and as you're folding it, you're exposing the layers of your steel to the atmosphere and burn out the carbon, where your optimal uh, carbon content for a sword or a knife or a dagger would be between 0.6 and 0.75%. Several years ago, I had a chance and the fortune of attending Kevin Cashin's presentation on historical steels versus modern steels. And he had the slide and had a very detailed uh, presentation on how, in fact, traditional Japanese katanas are equivalent for all practical purposes to 1075 modern steel with uh, an impurity here or there, but those will tend to not be significant in historical examples, or rather in the examples that are of sufficiently high quality. Now, uh, European swords of the uh, Roman period as well as the Viking period and into the medieval and high medieval and Renaissance eras were made from a material that is acquired in a very similar fashion and maybe the, only the scale varied between them. You either have a big manufacturing facility that just produces steel or small village workshops that produce steel for swords and more likely farming tools. Now what happens uh, with that is the folding technique is absolutely necessary for both Japanese and European as well as Chinese uh, items. Uh, in our case we're talking about swords because you do have to refine the steel, homogenize it, or if you're very very sophisticated, pattern weld it in such a way that you combine the properties of a very high carbon steel for your edge and a more ductile iron or medium carbon steel for your center. In fact, uh, if you are very careful when you listen to Peter Johnson give his amazing presentation on historical European swords, and I can argue that there's probably not a single scholar in our part of the world that knows more about European swords than Peter Johnson, who had the fortune uh, of looking at Ulfberts and every single sword he can get his hands on in Europe. He can tell you much more than I. However, what we can take away is the European swords do implement the technique of using an iron core and a high carbon or medium carbon edge all around. And that practice goes well into the 16th century. The implication of this is that historical European swords are not very springy. Uh, that is, if your core, the primary weight and shock bearing component of your sword is ductile, that is, it takes a set, it means your edge will take a set too when you bend it. In fact, try to take a look at swords in museums yourself or go at, to an antique exhibition and you will see European swords being bent and rebent. Now, why does that not bother the medieval European sword maker? Let's think about it. Well, bloomery steel is very shallow hardening, meaning if you have a cross section of a sword and you quench it, if you bother to quench it, only this much and this much hardens anyway, so it doesn't matter if you put ductile iron or medium carbon steel in the center because it's not going to harden anyway. And once you put in a fuller, you reduce the amount of soft stuff and give it a little bit more springiness. However, Almost all European swords, when they heat treated, have some version of a hamon just because of the nature of the steel they're working with. Many, many, many European historical swords don't actually have uh, any evidence of being heat treated. And the ones that were on the edge do not generally exceed 45 to 48 Rockwell on the C scale. Let's compare the edge hardness on a Japanese sword where the standard is about 60 to 65 Rockwell on the edge. That edge might tend to chip a little bit more than the European sword, however it retains itself much more during cutting. For our practical purposes, from the standpoint of looking at bloomery steel, those two sword designs don't actually 
differ that much because they both utilize a version of the same material. One can argue and from looking at the ores available in Europe versus Japan and the subtle differences in the smelting process that the Japanese steel tends to be better as it contains less of the two worst possible contaminants in the steel, that is phosphorus and sulfur. What phosphorus does in your forging process is it stays outside of the grain boundary, coating it like an oil. So as you're forging it, and remember we are working with pre-modern steels that don't have grain reducing additives, your grain grows, your grain grows, but the phosphorus stays on the outside until eventually your billet or whatever you're working with starts breaking apart on you and crumbling because the grain got so large and it's all surrounded with phosphorus that the billet cannot sustain itself. It crumbles like bread. Uh, Japanese tamahagani tem tends to have a very low uh, content of both sulfur and phosphorus. The reason why bloomery steels have relatively low content of uh, sulfur and phosphorus is the following. You see, when you make a smelter and don't use something called a crucible, which I will address very shortly, uh, as you're smelting your iron, the phosphorus and sulfur get to leave your iron, get to leave the thing, and as you're folding it, the gases, and both sulfur and phosphorus are gases, get to interact with the atmosphere, form oxides, and leave. So you can actually refine away a certain percentage of those two, for our purposes, poisonous contaminants. Let's take a brief look at how folding steel, in our case Play-Doh, removes impurities, slag, and other things from your actual billet, producing a fairly clean bar. So. I have here three colors of Play-Doh, or you can use plasticine. Uh, let's say this is super high carbon, this is kind of high carbon, this is medium carbon steel. I'm going to smash them together. But Ilya, where are the impurities you're talking about because this is a, a pretty, pretty clean block? Well, let's try this. I have my steel, I'm going to find some impurities. These are some pretty good impurities. I'm going to smack, place them in my Play-Doh, right? Starting to fold it, fold it. As I'm folding it, my steel is very pliable, and these rocks start coming out in the hot process. And if I'm a very good smith, I just pop it, it falls out, this falls out, I continue folding, 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 boom, and eventually a lot of these rocks will start getting to the surface. It's starting hard. It's beginning hard to find the actual rocks in there. And boom. Actually, this is perfect. By the time I get a perfectly even color, almost all the rocks are out. So a couple more folds, and this will be completely free of rocks and very homogeneous. So the same exact effect is, happens in both Europe as well as in Japan and in China when you're folding bloomery iron or bloomery steel. All the garbage that was in there from the smelting process is eventually removed and you're left with a very usable piece of homogeneous steel. Now, let's look at the rough uh, idea behind crucible steel. In front of me, I have a crucible. This is a modern crucible and it's relatively different from a traditional one, but not enough. So the traditional crucible would have been made out of several types of clay slurries that would make it fire and flux resistant. So the way crucible steel is made is I put a little bit of charcoal in there, 
then put some hematite magnetite, also known as iron ore, charcoal hematite, charcoal hematite. Make a stack. And then cover the top with clay and puncture a hole. That way I don't have a pipe bomb once I put it in the furnace. So the, my furnace can be a big, big fire with a blower underneath. It could look very much like a bloomery smelter, except my uh, crucible is enclosed. So it does not allow my stuff to escape. Once the material inside is molten, what happens is very much similar to the standard bloomery smelter, except it is enclosed, so my stuff doesn't float away. The hematite starts interacting with the uh, carbon in the charcoal. The slag melts out and moves to the surface. It will end up looking like glass, and the carbon gets absorbed by the iron, producing a steel puck. That steel puck is very solid inside and has no slag, as the slag moved to the top previously. It tends to be very high carbon. However, uh, this particular way of making steel uh, has become a fantastic way of making steel in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries before it was actually fairly subpar. And let me explain you why using some props. So. My first prop is my crucible. In our case, it's a jar. Inside, let me put some steel or iron. Boom, boom. This is my iron. And I will gently put it in. I'm actually terrible at making cocktails. So we'll see if the effect is visible. So this is my iron or steel. Boom. Now let's put a little bit of sulfur that was present in the ore. I'm gonna put it right in this corner so it's not super evenly distributed. You see, it's a little bit cloudy. Now, let's put a little bit a splash of phosphorus. Boom, boom, boom. Mm, nice phosphorus. Very good for digestion. And immediately, our crucible starts melting, right? It's melting, I'm making my crucible steel. Now, all my sulfur and phosphorus did not get to leave. In fact, uh, since a crucible steel making process is essentially a high temperature pressure cooker, all my gases have penetrated even further and evenly distributed themselves into my material. Um, one of the reasons why you even see uh, a beautiful, so to speak, pattern on top of a crucible steel sword is that the phosphorus allows for that pattern to become more prominent. The more beautiful the pattern, the higher the phosphorus. The consequences of this are actually fairly dire. You see, in his presentation, uh, Shad has said that the crucible steel making uh, process is far superior to the bloomery one. Uh, in a certain respect, yes, once we're talking about modern times and when you have methods of eliminating those two poisonous elements to the steel itself. However, not so much in the medieval period. You see, since you're not folding a crucible steel puck, since you're not stretching it out, exposing it to the atmosphere, folding it on itself, Phosphorus and sulfur don't get to leave it. And what you end up with is a very high carbon blade. Crucible steel blades tend to be between 1.4 and 1.6% carbon. And a very high phosphorus and high sulfur blade. Meaning you cannot really heat treat it consistently. In fact, there are records of Arabs during the Crusades reporting that they like the Western barbarian swords more than their own because the Western barbarian swords 
don't tend to break that easily. In fact, let's look at some data. Here I have this book, which you should buy. And let's look at a reference. So, a study of several uh, Woods blades concluded the following, that they have a very large percentage of carbon, between 1.2 and 1.6 percent, far exceeding that of normal steels. Significant contamination by phosphorus and sulfur. And what's more important is a low hardness typically not exceeding 25 units on the Rockwell scale. 25 units on a Rockwell scale is approximately your mild steel. Uh, the fact that it is typical for a crucible steel sword from the Middle East to not exceed 25 to 30 units on the Rockwell scale means that they will not heat treat it. Uh, why is that? Well, if you have a very high uh, contamination of phosphorus and sulfur, the sword is already brittle before heat treating, and if you heat treat it, it tends to be unusable. The exceptions, in fact, are br blades produced in Syria and Persia. And, however, those exceptions are rare, and when you see them, they usually belong to a sultan. And therefore cannot be attributed to be, be a part of a common practice. Let's look at another data concerning crucible steels. Uh, this is not crucible steels. However, this book, the following, is by Manfred Sasha. He has done research in uh, Damascus steels and pattern welding in Germany for a while and is a very good author to have in your library. We have another table consisting of several knife and saber blades, some of which include the European Solingen one. And once again, in those samples, the percentage of sulfur far exceeds what we consider modern acceptable uh, levels. So it ranges from 0 0.018 to point. To zero. So, uh, actually, it ranges from uh, 0 0.018 to 0 0.032, uh, and that is sulfur. Phosphorus uh, ranges from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, if I round it up. So, that is crucible steel. The Solingen steel is actually pretty nice. So what it means is uh, that the crucible steel has uh, very bad properties as a steel to begin with. Uh, it is not very friendly to heat treating and therefore when you're making a long blade uh, is far more useful when you leave it in its annealed state than in its hardened state. And the hardness levels are equally abysmal. So that does away with crucible steel for a moment. Now, let's look at my tables for uh, the most well-researched and extant to this day tradition of making swords from bloomery steel. And here we're talking about Japan. I recommend to every single scholar of European swords to study in and out uh, the tradition of sword making in Japan for the following reason. It is the only continuously existing tradition for over a thousand years of making swords from traditional materials. And considering that the starting material is very similar to the material that would have been used in Europe, um, it is very, very, very valuable for you to know the basic chemistry of both traditions, and one of them is still alive. So. Tamahagani, uh, or uh, Japanese bloomery steel, is divided traditionally into three grades. Grade 1, Grade 2, and Grade 3. The sulfur content for Grade 1 Tamahagani is 0 
and grade 3 tomahagani is 0.007 where grade 2 is 0.004 so those are about 10 times lower than crucible steel let's look at our phosphorus content the phosphorus content for grade 1 tomahagani is 0.017 and for grade 3 is 0.021 and again grade 2 is in between that is once again we have several times lower phosphorus content in Japanese tomahagani than in crucible steel what that means is tomahagani once it's properly processed that is folded a bunch of times and you reduce carbon remove some of the impurities so the slag will just melt away as the slag acts as flux and often enough you don't even have that much slag to begin with the and resulting bar of steel that you have tends to be superior to the crucible steel bar and that is pure science as in here is the chemistry here's what this chemistry does to the steel here is the end result steel right so from the chemical standpoint uh, Japanese swords are in fact superior to crucible steel swords so Japanese swords katanas and the like tend to be better as uh, feats of craftsmanship engineering uh, primitive chemistry than what we find in the Middle East let's ask us ourselves a question why is that the case well no item no common practice exists outside of its context the context for uh, Europe as well as the Middle East is the following in medieval Europe literacy rates for nobility were 10% of nobility was literate and 90% of nobility was illiterate and once you move lower in the class system it becomes worse so for all practical purposes most craftsmen if not all craftsmen making swords in Europe were illiterate being illiterate is a problem if you are trying to create a continuous tradition of acquiring knowledge and evolving your practice in fact since Europe is uh, culturally for most of its history under the influence of Christianity the position of the blacksmith is fairly abysmal to begin with until the 18th century there is no such thing as secular education and within the Christian tradition going to the Old Testament blacksmiths are actually a very low class of individuals and here is where it comes from so does everybody remember the story of Cain and Abel well Cain was punished not so much for the murder of his brother but from turning his face away from God and God says you turn your face away from me so I will turn you my face away from you and forever uh, Cain was forgotten by God away from heaven and the grandchildren of Cain became weapon makers and tool makers so traditionally within Christian theology the blacksmith is a little bit on the edge of Christianity he's not quite inside the community and therefore he's a little bit ostracized he's a necessary member of the community but always surrounded by some sort of myth of witchcraft or malfeasance as a result it is fairly evident why blacksmiths would not be very well educated uh, in fact if we look at the tradition of making European swords the blacksmith just forges out the billet the grinder grinds out what needs to be done in the sword the cutler puts all the fittings and the jeweler decorates everything and the European sword is valued primarily not on how good the quality of the steel is surprisingly enough because even the best European swords and museums have tremendous errors in their fullers uh, they tend to have file marks on the blade those are extant file marks meaning that the blade was not much harder than the file that was used to shape it uh, but the sword is valued for its exquisite uh, diamond and ruby incrustation let's move to the Middle East uh, the literacy rates for blacksmiths uh, are unknown to me at the moment 
However, if India or Mughal India is any indication, they cannot possibly be very good. And here's why. Metal workers in India traditionally in the lowest ranking of the caste system. That is, you're treated as almost a different lower race. And uh, with the advent of Buddhism, the position of the blacksmith in the Buddhist community increases just a little bit, but even then. So blacksmiths are not very valid actually to the day in the region. So when you look at beautifully encrusted Middle Eastern sabers and you see a maker's mark, a stamp on them, be very careful because that maker's mark is very likely not to be the mark of the blacksmiths or sword maker who made it, but the mark of either the merchant who is retailing those blades or the jeweler who put the beautiful decoration in there. Notice that both in Europe and in the Middle East, the maker's marks uh, are relatively rare and they in fact very rare in Europe uh, for the very obvious reason that in Europe especially the maker did not know how to write their name. And now let's move back to Japan and examine the position of the blacksmith in the Japanese society. You see, uh, the founding myth of Japan recorded in the Kojiki uh, founds the entire country on uh, three sacred objects. The jewel, the mirror, and the sword. So the necessity to produce a sword is already a foundational necessity, the foundational practice of the entire country in Shintoism. Uh, the practice of making a sword in Japan starts out with the Shinto ritual and it finishes itself with the Shinto ritual. Uh, the blacksmith, supposed to follow the tradition, uh, will abstain from eating meat as you're not supposed to enjoy uh, the death or pain of another being as you're trying to create something clean. So those are purity practices around making a sword. Uh, in the Edo period in Japan, 80% uh, of people who lived in the city knew how to read and write. 20% couldn't. Let me repeat that. 80% percent knew how to write their name and read the classics. So the situation for literacy among city dwellers or citizens was almost reversed to that of Europe. And what do we know? A uh, very large percentage, if not most, of uh, Japanese swords are signed on the tang with the name and the date. And if anyone's familiar with the writing system in the region, they know it is very complex as you have to basically know three writing systems. So, uh, what we know about the blacksmiths of Japan is that they were fairly well educated, means they could write down and pass their knowledge, and they were well respected members of the community for the most part, meaning that uh, they were more motivated to do a good job at whatever their job is. In fact, what you have, for example, in the Edo period, uh, the position of being one of the great smith, swordsmiths of Kyoto, for example, Ominokami Hisamichi was one of them, that is, he works under the retired emperor and just makes swords for the emperor. Uh, it was also very, very common uh, for an emperor to try their hands at making a sword, as the sword in Japan is considered a high art. I mentioned that the practice of passing down sword making knowledge it was very common in the region. What we know is the Honami family that is responsible for the appraisal and record keeping of swords made in Japan has uh, been in charge of the task for about a thousand years and we have records that detail specific features of specific swords by specific makers that were dated back to about 1000 or 1100 AD, meaning that not only a sword was being made in a certain way that was worth writing down, the practice of writing down the features of the sword was sophisticated enough to be able to uh, form and distinguish various parameters of what makes a good sword and which school the sword belongs to, that is, you have a sophisticated body of knowledge and practices around the item. 
in the region, the sword itself, the blade, is considered an independent work of art from the rest of the item. So if you buy a sword, you get the blade and then you take it to, uh, a, to Sugu, who makes you the fittings. In Europe, as well as the Middle East, when you buy a sword, you buy the whole thing and most of the attention, even now, is paid on how well the garniture of the item is executed. So, let's look at the physical properties uh, that we have alluded to so far. What is a typical European sword? A typical European, let's say, a long sword, is a fairly long double-edged sword with uh, a relatively hard edge between 45 to 48 Rockwell and a soft core. That is, it will take a set if you fight with it wrong. So the martial art that you would have to practice while using that sword will have to account for the fact that if you hit too hard or too flat, your sword will bend and stay bent. That is not my fault, that is science. Because bloomery steel tends to be very shallow hardening and for the most part uh, the items you make from it will have what we now call a hamon. The construction method also supports this idea because it is very common practice to insert either in medium carbon or low carbon core. That is, the core will bend and the edge will stay bent along with it. Uh, what is a typical uh, crucible steel sword? Typical crucible steel sword tends to be on the brittle side. It tends to be lighter uh, and uh, it tends to be soft. So a typical crucible steel sword is very good at fighting people who are not uh, wearing too much armor. It is very good for cutting bare flesh because of the way it is designed, because of, it, of its overall geometry, but to a modern user it will be quite disappointing. And this disappointment is not a trivial point, which I will address shortly. A typical katana is something with a very, very hard edge and a softer spine. Sometimes, depending on the school, you actually have relatively springy katanas because of the heat treating effect uh, that is artistically known as Utsuri or second hamon. When you look at what that effect is, it's actually bayonite being formed right above the hamon. And bayonite is a very uh, newly categorized mixture of martensite and perlite. That is, it's a network of hardened and unhardened particles. So uh, some katanas do spring quite a little bit. Now, that is not very common, but I needed to mention that. And let's now look at the implications of these features on the martial arts being practiced today and how they would have looked like at the time, shall we? All right, I ended with Japan, so let's begin with Japan. The traditional martial arts, or relatively traditional martial arts as we know them, I'm going to exclude kendo completely from said tradition. Uh, look like either Iaido or Mugai, or versions thereof. Those martial arts actually formed within the uh, peaceful Edo period and uh, have some insight onto the wartime martial arts, but they're mainly focused on dueling. The reason why they were formed is because when the Warring States period ended, the samurai class uh, needed to justify their military status, so they started combining their intellectual and administrative responsibilities as well as spiritual responsibilities with uh, their martial responsibilities and started forming uh, very sophisticated and very well studied uh, ways of using their weapon that also reflects their refinement as an upper-class individual. However, the features of those martial arts is very strict, abrupt movements that try to preserve the integrity of the sword they're using as much as they try to defeat the enemy. That is, if you're sloppy, you will destroy your expensive sword immediately and the other person will simply kill you because you don't have a weapon. Right? So the martial art relies on very quick, direct, fast cuts. It does not look at all like anything in Hollywood because you're not relying on 5, 10, 20, one hour long duels. No, the 
typical duo will probably last between uh, 5 and 30 seconds, no more, with minimal amount of frivolous sword use. You position yourself, when you draw cut, you try to be faster than the other guy, and when, the, when or if that fails, you look for an opening and do a fast cut or fast thrust, and that defeats the enemy. Now, look at uh, historical European martial arts, or HEMA. Well, consider the following. I've already mentioned that the swords that are laying around in museums and not very springy and tend to be on the soft side. However, the swords used by the practitioners of HEMA are very hard and very springy. In fact, um, historical European martial artists always brag at how, at, about how hard their swords are, how, how much they flex. And they break even them. Means, uh, if you're fighting with a sword that is basically modern space-age steel, and you manage to break that, that means uh, your body mechanic that you're memorizing as you practice, and the way you interpret the movements in the manual exceeds the performance of modern space-age steels like S701, L6, so on and so forth. What do you think would happen if you give a historical European martial artist right now, switch around the S7 sword for uh, a medieval sword made from a combination of soft iron in the core and relatively hard 45 Rockwell edge. How long would that sword survive? Well, I would uh, willing be willing to bet that it's not quite long. Uh, so uh, my suspicion is uh, that the interpretations of the move from Mayor Lichtenhauer practiced by HEMA is wrong. Yes, I've said it. It's, I think it's fairly wrong. Why? Because uh, the swords would not, uh, historical opinion swords that produced those manuals would not have survived the, their interpretation practiced in modern times. So I'm not saying that uh, HEMA is not a legitimate martial art. I'm questioning the H in HEMA. And the way you can test it is you can buy a cheap mild steel sword and practice with it and see which interpretations of the moves you have allow for your sword to survive the longest. And I would be betting that those interpretations would be the correct ones. And I will also wager a second bet on top of that, that those interpretations that uh, circulate around the fact that your sword will bend or snap fairly easily uh, would produce a European martial art that looks suspiciously like Iaido, or at least more like Iaido than Hema looks now. Now, uh, let's go back to Crucible Steel Sword. Um, you might have noticed that most, if not all, swords made out of crucible steel uh, tend to be very highly curved sabers. That is not an accident. You see, when you're dealing with a very soft and brittle item, the way to prevent stress from going sideways or this way too much is by introducing a greater amount of curve into the item. So the curve itself uh, deflects the shock into its center of mass that exists outside of the blade itself. So if this is the blade, the center of mass is here, so if you hit it, things go away. And uh, from what we know of the British records of people fighting with sabers in India specifically, they use a lot of circular motions that are around the body. Uh, if you want more detail on this specific instance, the sword fighting in India using a saber, please check out uh, the channel by Matt Easton called Schola Gladiatoria. And he is damn near an expert in that specific region and time period. All right, so let's conclude. Now, if one of us picks up a historical European or a historical Middle Eastern sword and starts fighting with it, the 
optimal performance of that item will greatly disappoint us. But that does not mean that those swords are bad. That doesn't mean that the katana is bad. That doesn't mean that the katana is better or worse as a sword than the Middle Eastern or historical European sword. All those swords are perfect. It is, in fact, we who are wrong. We have to dull down and bracket away our disappointment because our expectations are based on looking at swords as purely tools and tools made after a man landed on the moon. So those items that we're using now are outperforming medieval swords according to the specifications that did not exist during the medieval time. If we practice historical European or other martial arts, we have to adjust our expectations and practices themselves with an account for how the items around which the martial art formed would have performed. That is, the sword, if we take a Zweihander, Montante, a long sword, a bastard sword, those swords are not bad. And comparing the swords between Japan, Middle East, or Europe is somewhat of a futile task because we cannot even compare those practices right now. Those items exist in a cultural historical context. And this presentation was basically the only way you can objectively adjudicate between those things by merely judging the steel that was used. Because if you start looking at the shape or whether the sword bends or doesn't bend, uh, if you start thinking, well, this sword has two edges, so it's twice as good as a single-edged sword, that would be missing the point because the sword has developed to serve a specific purpose. So a double-edged sword, for example, would not be as good in the context where a single-edged sword evolved. Here's one tidbit. A greatly curved uh, Middle Eastern saber is better by far than a European longsword if you're using it on a horse. Think about it. You're riding on a horse and you want to thrust someone at full gallop using a sword. A straight sword, when it goes into the wound, will be immediately taken away from you by the inertia and might even break your wrist if you hold on to it too much. But a curved sword will slide out. A longer sword will put too much torque on you and probably break your wrist. But a shorter curved sword is much more efficient as a thrust, which is very counterintuitive. On the other hand, a European longsword is very efficient when used as a spear when you have sword against someone in full armor because you can actually get in into the armpits, the neck, the lower vena cava, and a curved sword is probably not as good at that practice. It doesn't mean one is superior than the other. It means that we have not been paying enough attention as a community to the historical context of the martial art. And for the next video, we have not been paying enough attention to the cultural, artistic, as well as religious context that produce the shapes of those items. Well, that's all for now. Please subscribe, please stay tuned, because we're working on a bunch of very exciting builds that you asked us to do. Goodbye. Once again, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Please click the link in the description below. And if you guys like this historical talk as much as I did, be sure to tell us in the comments below exactly what topics you want to see us cover next. And as always, keep requesting those full builds, whether it's from anime, video game, or a historical item. We won't know what to make unless you let us know.